Well, um, in this next group of presentations, we will be talking about audit reform. Our speakers will cover the implementations in the UK, Germany and France, and the wider perspective of the European Commission. Our first speaker on the subject of audit reform is Stefan Hedril, CEO of the UK Financial Reporting Council. And Mr. Hedril will give a few insights into where the UK stands to date in terms of implementation. He will also touch on the implications for smaller listed entities that haven't really thought about the role of audit yet. But before he will speak, we have a Buzzmaster question for all of you. So, Mr. Hedril, be prepared to jump on stage, but first take out your smartphone to answer the following question. How is the implementation process going in your country? You can either choose not started, internal ministerial discussion, discussion with stakeholders, draft law published, or I don't know. <laughs> what implementation process? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. no, I didn't. I know he didn't say that. Yeah. But it's, I, I think that's the I don't, that's the I don't know column. Oh, you're not, you're both not in the 10%. Okay, okay, good. Well, votes uh, coming in. I see the circle getting grayer and grayer, so a lot of people are getting in. Um, well, Mr. Hedrill, the floor is yours. Give him a big hand. <laughs> Stefan Hedrill. Thank you very much. I look forward to this, says he through gritted teeth. Um, my thanks to uh, Fee, especially to Olivier for uh, inviting me to speak today. It's a, it's a good opportunity to set out a little bit about what's going on uh, in the UK, and I'm delighted that we have a large and expert audience uh, to engage on this. The other thing that's large is the legislation, large and somewhat complex. And we haven't got much time to put it in place. We're already a year into the uh, implementation period. Um, and the complexity is added to because we have a considerable number of member state options to, to consider, as Lord Hill mentioned. And they add significantly to the complexity. In the UK, we're awaiting decisions by the UK government on uh, many of these options. Uh, we were probably waiting rather longer than we had initially hoped, but we've had the small thing of a general election. Um, the general election hasn't delayed the implementation of this directive from regulation because it was a major controversial issue in the election campaign. Indeed, I studied all the election manifestos and couldn't find a single reference to audit, <laughs> for which I'm sure we can all be extremely grateful. Um, but we do await decisions, and... Uh, it's not for me to say what our new government, because it is a new government, it was a coalition government and now it is a Conservative Party government, what the new government will decide. I can, however, try to give a view on the thinking in the FRC, especially on those matters which we expect to fall to us uh, in the light of the government's decisions. But let me start with some overarching objectives that we and the government have in place uh, for the uh, what we hope will be the impact of the change. First and foremost is that change promotes audit quality in the UK and across the U EU, and does so in the interests of investors. Second, that competition, something mentioned by Lord Hill, in the audit market is strengthened in a way that supports quality through innovation. And third, that we end up with a regulatory regime that provides confidence to investors and to firms by being fair, understandable, uh, and independent. Now, to achieve these objectives, we need to recognize that the laws and regulations do not deliver success without the active support and participation of those they apply to uh, and those who benefit from them. Both in the design of regulation and in its operation, we need the involvement of, of investors, audit committees, and the firms themselves. Audit quality will not be achieved unless 
all of these stakeholders uh, inform the process and uh, take part in it uh, later. Let me provide one, what I think is a crucial example of this, audit retendering and rotation. Both can drive innovation and audit quality, or frankly, they can drive a price war and a reduction in quality. Exactly the same regulations can produce either outcome. Now, the legislation seeks to mitigate the risk by making it clear that the audit committee, not the company executive and the CFO, take the, take the lead in assessing audit tenders. But more than that is required. Audit committees need to own the quality agenda, heart and soul. And that requires incentivization, not just instruction. And that's why in the UK, when we introduced retendering a few years ago, we also made provision for fuller audit committee reporting on their oversight of the audit, extended auditor reporting, which you heard uh, quite a lot about uh, this morning, and the sharing of audit inspection findings with audit committees. Both audit committee and auditor reporting have attracted, I think, positive investor responses. And that has encouraged both the committees and the firms to pursue quality and innovation. And our inspection findings give committees an agenda for dialogue with the firm. This approach of engaging with committees, investors, and the firms themselves, so far, I believe, has moved us forward. And we must maintain this strong triangle with the regulator, audit committees and firms working together with engaged investors and an engaged and, I hope, helpful uh, audit regulator. This spirit of cooperation is also necessary because the complexity of the le legislation and the interaction of member state options will, frankly, generate problems in practice that need to be sorted out with goodwill. FEE has already identified some of these in its response to the consultations. As re regulators, we must remember that we're implementing single market le legislation doesn't quite feel like that at the moment, I have to say, and achieve as much coherence and convergence as possible. And if it's not possible to achieve that initially, we must stand ready with the European Commission to address problems as they arise uh, after the, implement, after the uh, regulations have been put in place. This has got to be something of a dynamic process, given the amount of choice there is for governments and regulators, and I suspect the inevitability, despite the best will on all, all sides, uh, that it will not be implemented in the same way in every member state. You might well ask, why do we not just implement the directive in the same way in each member state? For example, in the relation to the much debated issue of the sale of non-audit services to audit clients. We have consulted on this in the UK, and it, I think it's a good example of why it's actually quite hard to end up with a one-size-fits-all answer and command consensus. Some in the profession have called for us not to go beyond the requirements of the legislation in terms of the items on the blacklist. On the other hand, investors have, have called on us not to reduce current UK requirements, which in fact do go beyond uh, the EU legislation. There have also been mixed reviews on our suggestion of a so-called whitelist we put this forward to provide certainty on what can be sold. Some have welcomed this. Others have argued that it will, in effect, stultify the exercise of discretion by audit committees. In the absence of clear responses to this part of our consultation, we've not yet reached a view on these points. Although I will say that whether we have a white list or not, we are committed to a principles-based approach uh, that looks forward to audit committees being able to apply, apply their judgment uh, to these issues uh, and to this, the um, purchase of non-audit services beyond the blacklist. Now that brings me to the nature of our inspection work in future. At present, we inspect the largest 10 firms on a regular basis, with a much less frequent scrutiny of some of the others in the mid-tier. The legislation in future requires us to review all firms who undertake public interest entity audits, including, we believe, although it isn't entirely clear, every insurance company and very many small financial institutions. The list of auditors that we need to inspect may therefore grow from uh, around about 10 
to close on 100. Many will have only one or two public interest entity audits, and the risk to the public is minimal compared to the audits of major banks and major insurers. We must be proportionate in the, and coordinated in the way that we approach uh, this, coordinated with the professional bodies who already inspect uh, such firms, smaller firms, and, for, and do a perfectly good job of doing so. We must be alive to the risk of independent inspection if conducted in the wrong way, driving firms out of the public interest entity market and, in fact, reducing competition when we want to see it increase. We must in keep inspection costs in check and we must also consider whether our normal op reporting, uh, open reporting on firm performance is appropriate in relation to a small firm given that we will only inspect a very small sample of its work. As a regulator, we must always ensure that we are achieving our goals in the most efficient and effective way. The implementation of the directive is not just about new regulation of the profession. It should also be a moment when we test how well we go about doing our job as regulators. We should not new, adopt new powers that challenge those we regulate without challenging ourselves. Are we proportionate? Do our standards promote quality or inhibit innovation? Do we help firms to drive quality, or does our criticism of them make them just risk averse? Are we sufficiently accountable to and a, and a channel for the views of investors and the wider public? We're addressing these issues now, and I believe they are as important to the achievement of, of our goals as the implementation of the legislation itself. To make legislation work, we need to nurture a coalition of investors, auditors, and audit committees in the cause of quality. And to do that, as regulators, we must challenge ourselves to earn the trust and confidence needed to lead effective change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, um, as always, we had some questions coming in for you. Let's have a look at the screen. Would you select one to address? Just a minute. Without my glasses, I'm not sure. Oh, well. <laughs> um, uh, maybe I, um, I could select one for you. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Let me have a go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an honor that you can choose one yourself. <laughs> I know. Um, well, should, should mandatory audit firm rotation be exported beyond... Oh, it's got bigger now. Beyond yeah, the boundaries of the EU. Uh, James, I think that's, uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I don't think it's for anyone in the EU to, to tell other parts of the world how to go about their business, frankly. Um, and we'd probably get a bloody nose if we tried it. But I do think, um, from our experience at least of uh, retendering, that it has enlivened the, um, the audit market. It has led to some innovation. I think necessarily combined with some of the other things we've done, included extended audit reporting, I think it's been a force for good. So I would certainly encourage other parts of the world uh, to, um, uh, to follow it. There is, of course, an element of extraterritoriality uh, in what we're doing, um, and I think that's, uh, that's something that's going to lead to some lively debate over the, the next... Um, few years, as, as some of it affects the US in particular. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we're not quite sure yet how that will work, but I think mm. it's very important to sort that out. Okay. Okay. Let's have a look at another question. You could pick another one. A lot of them coming in now. Does the FRC support Lord Hill in his positive... What's that last word? <laughs> Uh, which one? Oh, that's the oh, it's going away. The, the gray one. Well, make the, make him bigger. We we, we wait till he's uh, oh, well, he's, ready, still going on, he's right. ready. He's ready. I, I couldn't get, see that hadn't finished. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is so thrilling. Don't get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's allowed, it's allowed to make uh, to make language mistakes. My English is far from. I, I have to say that as the British European Commissioner, before we get to the end of the. Uh, Question: I am bound to support him. Um, <laughs> no, I, th I think perhaps we'll move on. <laughs> um, well, joint, I, I, think it's joint I could. 
I could find him in the <laughs> audience. Does, does Fee do typing courses? <laughs> 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 Jos von Hout. <laughs> yeah, we found you. But it's so honest of you that you um, uh, you, you were logged in as anon anonymous. But can you ask your? And now we see your name. Can, can you ask your question live to uh, to Stefan? Sure, I'd love to do that. So my question is: Does the IFRC support Lord Hill in his positive support on joint audit as a choice for businesses? Um, well, I, I have to say that. I mean, we have in European, in UK legislation at the moment, the option for joint audit. Uh, and I'm sure the government will want to maintain that. Um, uh, I suspect, I don't know for certain, that um, in, in, it, in pursuing the joint op audit option in the uh, legislation, that it will take the same, it will apply the same period as it does for the retendering uh, option. Um, I mean, our experience in the UK has not been that positive with joint audit, less positive than perhaps it has been in, in France. Maybe that's something to do with the way that we've approached it. But uh, So I wouldn't say that our support was that positive, but we certainly don't want to see the option uh, in some way not, not pursued in the UK. And we'd leave it to the market to, to decide, basically. Okay, well, well addressed. Thank you for, for your <laughs> introduction, and we will later see you in the panel. Give him a big hand. Stefan Hadrell. Our second speaker in this cluster is Kai-Uwe Martin, Deputy Chairman of APEC, the German Auditor Oversight Committee. And Mr. Martin will address the oversight matters of the new legislation and touch upon the plans of the German government in the coming months. Okay. Cool. Give him a big applause. Thank you very much for these words of welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation to FEE to have the opportunity to say some words about the implementation uh, of uh, the EU audit reform in Germany. And as you have mentioned, uh, I was asked by FEE to focus uh, on the oversight structure. Uh, I want to uh, structure my presentation in, let me say, three uh, parts. First of all, I want to remind us what has been the intention of the EU audit reform. Then I want to stress a little bit the challenges uh, which uh, uh, governments uh, has uh, when they implement uh, the audit reform, as I see it from the German point of view. Then I want to explain, as I was asked by FEE, to describe where we stand in Germany about the public oversight uh, structure. And then I try to make a short uh, conclusion. Okay, let's start. Uh, I want to start uh, with the intention of uh, the audit uh, reform. And uh, I'm sure that we all can remember that it has been the financial and economic crisis which uh, leads to some reaction by the EU regulator. And uh, during, in this uh, regulation, also the role of the auditors has to become more and more into the focus. Uh, when we have got uh, this EU audit reform, a lot of uh, objectives has to be uh, implemented uh, in this uh, audit reform. Once has been managed by uh, Lord Hill when, we, when he gave his speech now, he mentioned that the audit function uh, should be contribute to increase financial stability. That was one of his words during his speech. Uh, there has been other objectives like uh, that uh, it should be assured that we need a higher level of inspect investor protection and consumer con confidence in the internal uh, market. And last but not least, uh, one of the main objectives will be that the independent public oversight authorities in the EU member sta states should be, should be strengthened. These are the objectives uh, which we have to see. and. Uh, uh, I come to these objectives uh, when I draw a conclusion whether they are achieved uh, or not. As I mentioned before, uh, I think all governments in the 
EU member states uh, have to consider some challenges when they implement uh, this EU audit reform. Uh, and I pick up some uh, challenges as we see it from the German point of view. Firstly, uh, this EU audit reform is the second big audit reform which we have since the year 2006, especially when we talk about public auditor oversight. We see other challenges from our perspective. Uh, uh, one of the challenges for each government is, especially for the German government, is that they seek for a balance between, on the one hand side, a strong self-regulation by the uh, uh, audit profession, and on the other side, the need for a strengthened independent public oversight. The other challenge will be the AUC, the Auditor Oversight Commission, exists now since uh, 10 years, and a lot of experience and knowledge have been collected, and uh, we will see how this challenge to transfer this experience and knowledge in the EU uh, law. And last but not least, uh, there must be a so-called political willpower uh, to, uh, has to be ensure that the audit reform will uh, create uh, really an improved system. At this step, I have a question for the bus master. Yeah? And I hope you will uh, join us for answering uh, this question. The question which I have for the audience is, do you think that an efficient independent oversight can contribute to good quality audits? Okay, okay. Make your decision. Okay, it seems to me that uh, a clear majority yeah, support the idea that uh, independent public oversight can contribute to good uh, audit quality. Thank you very much for this support. And let's uh, go back uh, to the task which I have to explain how we, where we stand uh, in Germany. Again, with the focus of public uh, oversight. Uh, a few weeks uh, ago, the Ministry of Economics uh, issued a so-called draft law. It has been around about the end of May, beginning uh, of June. And uh, this uh, draft law uh, consider the uh, auditor oversight reform. And uh, it was a little bit uh, surprising that all the stakeholders who, which are, have been asked to give their comments uh, to the ministry, they get a, uh, a consultation period within less than one week. It has been three or four days for consultation. I think that is not usual uh, in the normal business when a draft law has been issued and uh, stakeholders will be asked for consultation. But in Germany, it has been less than one, one week. Uh, the next step uh, will be that this uh, draft law will be approved by the federal cabinet uh, uh, on, and it's planned uh, for the 1st of uh, July. It could also be the 8th of July. And uh, if you check your calendar, 1st of July will be next uh, week. And then this uh, 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 proposal will be submitted to the German parliament. It is planned that the approval by the parliament should be the end of uh, this year, 2015, maybe the beginning of next uh, year, and the new regulator uh, should be established in the second quarter uh, of 2016. That means that uh, so far not uh, the Auditor Oversight Commission, where I, where I stand for, will be the regulator for the German audit profession. It will be a new regulator beginning its work on the 17th of June uh, next year. Who is the new regulator, or who will be the new regulator for the audit uh, profession uh, in, in Germany? Uh, the plan within the legal proposal is that uh, the so-called Federal Office for Economic Affairs and Export Control, this is an agency which is under the legal oversight of the Ministry of Economics, 
should be responsible for the public oversight of the German uh, audit profession. The short form is BAFA, and uh, I will use this BAFA as a short form now for my next uh, presentation. Who is BAFA? Uh, BAFA has a current wide range of responsibilities. Uh, let me give you some uh, examples. For example, uh, they are responsible for the external trade, including export control of military goods. Uh, BAFA is responsible for dealing with matters of energy supply, including renewable energies. Or BAFA is responsible for protecting the domestic industry from uncontrolled market access by third countries, and so on and so on. As you can see from this uh, task, that there is no uh, experience or, or knowledge uh, uh, in accounting, auditing, or corporate governance. The plan by the German uh, Ministry of Economics is that there should be uh, a new department within uh, the BAFA who should deal with this task, which I mentioned in the EU audit reform regarding uh, the public oversight uh, matters. This will lead to a clear change in the governance uh, structure. Uh, uh, to say it in concrete uh, words, no one of the board members so far, we are 10 board members in Germany, would be transfer uh, to the new uh, regulator, BAFA, to the new department within BAFA, and no one of the directors, that means in our case, uh, the head of our several departments, will be transferred to the new uh, regulator. The majority uh, of our staff, uh, that means the inspectors and uh, 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 the guys who work with, with uh, investigation uh, matters and uh, administration staff, the majority will, legal, uh, will transfer from the AOC to the new regulator by, uh, on a legal way, and the financing uh, will be done uh, on the one hand side by, by taxpayers, the German taxpayers, and in the majority by so-called fees which should be charged for any services which the BAFA would uh, deliver for uh, the auditors. Uh, what we can see in this case that uh, from our perspective, from the German AOC perspective, it seems to me that there is a lack of political willpower to achieve uh, the objectives which uh, the EU Commission has included in the uh, audit reform. I'm sure that you will uh, ask uh, what is our plan as the EOC, and we have discussed it uh, many, many times uh, with the ministry and other representatives from other ministry. The EOC position is clear. Uh, we believe that uh, only a standalone regulator is uh, the imperative to secure, also for the future, an independent uh, public oversight body and a public oversight body which is visibly. The, the choice of the Ministry of Economics in Germany to, to take the BAFA or to include the department within this BAFA uh, federal office is not the best uh, alternative within this game. And there's no rational or logical uh, reason which stands uh, behind, behind this. To give you a full picture about uh, this uh, topic, uh, uh, regarding the, uh, the oversight of the German audit profession is that, and we totally decree, that uh, within this legal proposal there is a delegation foreseen for oversight tasks, so uh, the oversight of the non-PIE auditors remains with uh, the Chamber of Public Accountants, and this is supported by the German uh, AOC and uh, the so-called ultimate responsibility, which we have had within the last uh, 10 years uh, for all the decision within the Chamber of Public Accounts in Germany uh, should, trans should be subject to the future regulator, in this case to the uh, BAFA. Uh, as you can see, that it is the audit profession uh, in Germany will, which will be affected by these traumatic uh, consequences, which I have uh, uh, ex explained. Let's come to a short uh, conclusion. Uh, the AOC, the German uh, public oversight body, is not convinced that the current legal proposal will achieve the objective uh, 
of the EU audit reform, how the EU Commission has planned it within their EU uh, audit reform. And we are not convinced that this will lead to efficient oversight, auditor oversight body uh, uh, in, in Germany. We are absolutely sure that we are not alone uh, in, this, uh, uh, um, um, in this reaction. Uh, I had had a lot of talks to uh, 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 representatives of the audit profession in Germany and I'm sure also within Europe who have uh, uh, the, same, the same clear view on this uh, issue. Uh, secondly, uh, it's, our, uh, it's our, uh, in our opinion that this legal proposal is not the right answer to find a good balance between, on the one hand side, a strong self-regulation, which we support by the audit profession, and on the other side, independent auditor oversight uh, on, on the other hand. Uh, we will see what happens. It's an exciting time over the next uh, weeks. Uh, I hope I could uh, explain the actual situation in Germany uh, in this short uh, presentation, and I'm happy to have your questions or your remarks uh, to these dramatic uh, changes which we see uh, in Germany. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for the speech, two short questions. Why do you believe that there's lack of political willpower in Germany to make better improvements to the current system? It's a very good question. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I should thank you for this question. Uh, it's, rather, it's rather difficult uh, to explain a decision where we can see any logical or rational reason which stands behind it. Uh, it could be that uh, the, the Ministry of Economics in, in Germany has the, has the objective to reduce bureaucracy. And if you compare the two uh, plans which are on the table, on the one hand uh, to create a standalone authority for public oversight, and on the other hand, as is now planned, to create a new department within this buffer, which is, as I've uh, explained, responsible for export control, uh, then it could be that, uh, that uh, this, the, the plan B to, to create this department could be a contribution to reduce bureaucracy in this case. But this is not rational, uh, because you must know that the plan is that you must know that this headquarter uh, of this buffer is located close to Frankfurt. And uh, the new department, which should be responsible for the public oversight, should be located in Berlin. That means that uh, 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 the new regulator uh, needs new buildings, new rooms, uh, and so on. So there are no synergy effects uh, uh, regarding cost, uh, and so on, so okay. that you can support the idea to reduce bureaucracy. Yeah, okay, okay. If it was upon you, um, well, those two buildings had to be closer to each other, but what would the future of audit regulator in Germany look like? Is it mentioned here on the... No, 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 no. The, the, these are the, questions okay. from, uh, from okay. out of the audience. Yeah. We, we, you can pick one uh, 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 later on. But, uh, can you, can you re uh, repeat it? Yeah, if it was upon you, what would the future of audit regulator in Germany look like? Very, very difficult question. As I have described, it's, uh, if, 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 uh, if uh, the, the plan will become effective that uh, a department in an in a agency which is under the Econom uh, Ministry of Economics is responsible for, for the auditor oversight, uh, it's really difficult to imagine uh, how these consequences will be. Uh, what I expect is, uh, uh, is that uh, uh, so-called uh, inspections and investigations, which are the main task of uh, such oversight body, will become more formalistic as it is now. And uh, uh, I cannot imagine that a more formalistic approach in inspections and investigations will be in the interest of audit profession within Germany, in Europe, or uh, within third countries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Looking at the uh, questions, um, I like the question of Mr. Irving. Do you think the German government will be liable for the next financial crisis <laughs> under the new structure? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's a very, very good, very good question. Uh, 
it is not possible to give a very good answer to this uh, question. Just, but just be open. Yeah, uh, yeah, just just be open. Yeah, yeah. I'm frankly too, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, now it's not possible to say uh, whether there. If uh, I think no one in this room uh, will be happy to have uh, a new financial crisis in the in the near future, and. Uh, uh, no one is interested in, and if it will have happened, uh, I think it will be uh, not possible to uh, to create a strong link between the decisions of the German government, which I have described now, and and the reasons for the financial crisis which stands behind it. I think that's not possible. Okay. okay. One last question. You spoke about the public service remuneration scheme and that it will cause difficulty in terms of attracting and maintaining talent and experts. What could we do to address this? What could we do to address this? Yeah, I think uh, in this room we have uh, uh, auditors. That means they are experts in accounting, auditing and corporate governance. This is normally the, the field of uh, uh, the business uh, they, they do, and if you if you are an expert in the field, uh, you have the right to to get a competitive salary for for your work. And uh, uh, I think uh, the auditors have the right that on the other side, on the on the oversight uh, side, there are only the same experts sitting at the same table. Yeah? Uh, my problem is that uh, I cannot imagine uh, that. Uh, uh, if this new department within this BAFA would be created, and we all know that in the public service, yeah, the salaries which should be paid, uh, uh, we not, which are normally paid, uh, creates no experts in this way as we need for inspections and investigations. And I find that, uh, that uh, our auditors, uh, not only in Germany, also in Europe and outside of Europe, they have the right that they have on the other side of the table the same experts as they are. Thank you very much Thank for you. addressing this speech. You. you can either sit here or sit uh, uh, behind the table, but Mr. Hadrill uh, chose the uh, soft chairs, so <laughs> we were a good decision. Our third speaker is uh, Christian Schrick, Managing Director of ANSA, and Mr. Schrick will highlight the French state of affairs and will explain the various issues of the audit reform and the difficulty that might arise in the disharmonized landscape. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try and give you an, an outline of uh, a business perspective and a French perspective. Um, first of all, the business perspective. Um, the business community generally supports the main goal of, of the audit reform, which is a common EU framework for the audit of listed companies ensuring common standards for the quality of audits and independence of external auditors to contribute to the restoration of investor confidence in listed companies, as Lord Hill has said. Uh, however, um, I must say that this ambitious harmonization goal which uh, was ambitious because the landscape was extremely fragmented uh, across the EU, um, has uh, spawned a somewhat disappointing result in our view. Um, in particular, we see an accumulation of constraints uh, in the EU audit reform intended to ensure the independence of auditors and to increase competition amongst auditors. I'll just read through the list. Compulsory rotation of signatories in firms. Incentive for public tendering process for the selection of auditors. Prohibition of the selection of an auditor, which has been the auditor in the four previous years. Independence certification by auditors. The special role and responsibility given to audit committee in supervising the selection of auditors and reviewing their independence and authorizing non-audit services. A maximum total length for the terms of the audit engagements. A list of prohibited non-audit services. A ceiling for non-audit fees. All of this makes for a very complex situation. And uh, we believe that insufficient attention has been given to the potential consequences of the sum of these constraints on the management, not only of the audit firms, but also on the relationship between the companies and their auditors. And they're not always consistent. For instance, 
is it consistent to seek independence of auditors but set a minimum term at one year? Many options, furthermore, are open in the audit reform to member states, which will effectively reduce the harmonization of EU audit standards. First of all, the choice of minimum length and maximum length of terms is very wide, between one and 10 years. And these terms can be extended to up to 20 years after a tender offer, or up to 24 years in the case of a joint audit. The list of prohibited non-audit services may be both extended or reduced. The ceiling for non-audit services fees may be reduced and the scope of the public interest entities may be extended. Now, it is too early to say whether the landscape will be as fragmented as the audit reform allows, but it is highly likely that it will remain quite fragmented because all of these options were part and parcel of the overall negotiation, and therefore they responded to uh, requests by the various member states. The European business community is particularly concerned with the probable consequences of, for the quality and cost of audit of the combination of these constraints and of the national differences in minimum or maximum durations of audit engagements. Such differences, we believe, will make it more difficult or even in some cases impossible for EU parent companies to synchronize audit engagements throughout their group for one single audit firm. And we believe that having the same audit firm, or at least if in the case of joint audit, which is the case for French public companies, uh, to have at least one of the two audit firms throughout the group is important to ensure consistency and quality of audit. If a company needs to hire different firms throughout its group, this will increase complexity and costs and may affect the quality of the audit. Also, options open on prohibited non-audit services and the cap on fees for such services will probably create problems, not only for the audit firms themselves, but also for the public interest entities. They will apply not only to each individual PIE, but also to its parent company and to its subsidiaries, there will therefore probably be inconsistencies and uncertainties to be managed. And the most affected groups will be groups which include PAE subsidiaries in various EU countries, which will have to uh, respect the various national frameworks. Business Europe has written to Lord Hill to uh, highlight these concerns and ask him to consider appropriate uh, answers. So much for the business perspective. Now the French perspective. The French government has decided to implement the audit reform through what we call ordonnance, executive orders, to be adopted by the government by end March 2016 on the basis of a delegation given by the French parliament. The government has extensively consulted all stakeholders through a series of meetings over the past, let's say, nine months but hasn't yet made its conclusions known. So at this point, I can't tell you uh, what the government intends to do. In fact, we understand that it will present to the various stakeholders next week uh, the main directions. But let me say a few words about the areas of consensus amongst stakeholders. First of all, as you know, and has been previously mentioned, um, France has a joint audit requirement for listed companies. And generally speaking, um, that will remain uh, and is the choice of the business community because we believe the advantages of a joint audit outweigh the extra cost and complexity. Joint audit provides two views instead of one on major issues and it gives stronger assurance on the quality of accounts and strengthens the independence of both auditors because they have to uh, withstand the scrutiny of the other auditor. It also provides the company with more continuity because when you change an auditor, as will be compulsory under the new rules, you can maintain the other auditor on board. The second area of consensus amongst the stakeholders is a long mandatory engagement period. Uh, the French uh, rule has been for a long time now 
to have a mandatory engagement of six years. And it is extremely probable that we will keep six years or perhaps five years. Um, this, we believe, is very important to ensure the independence of the auditor, especially vis-a-vis -vis the management of the company. But it also allows the auditor more time to know and understand a group's businesses and specificity. As far as the audit committee is concerned and relations between the auditors and the audit committee, the French system is by and large already largely consistent with the new EU rules, so there will probably be very few changes. Now, the areas where there is less con convergence. Well, first of all, as uh, previously mentioned, uh, member states have the option to add to the list of public interest entities. In France, there are approximately 2,000 such entities under the EU rule. And a number of regulators are in favor of extending the list to further entities. Um, most stakeholders, on the other hand, are in favor of sticking to the EU list. But the main area uh, of uh, this debate, uh, and the most difficult one for us, is non-audit services. The French system is a very strict one at present. Um, Non-audit services may only be provided if they have links to audit services and according to professional standards approved by the French uh, Auditor Oversight Board. Um, if they don't, uh, if they're not provided as according to these standards, they may not be provided, so it's simple as that. This is exactly the opposite to the EU approach, which is a list of prohibited services. So the debate has been, how do we move from one system to the other, and can we combine the advantages of both systems? Um, the audit profession is clearly in favor of the implementation of the EU rules and no national specificity. The regulators, on the whole, are in favor of rather stricter rules with respect to prohibited services, but also, it seems, uh, to the cap on non-audit service fees. Business is, I would say, somewhere in between. Um, there, is, there's, there have been discussions between the business community and uh, the audit profession, um, which would look towards sort of a white list, as mentioned previously in the UK context, uh, whereby the professional standards that exist today uh, might be the basis for a list of uh, services that would appear to be uh, allowed uh, without any particular uh, um, d debate by the audit committee. Uh, any other uh, services would require uh, an extensive uh, uh, scrutiny by the committee. So, as a matter of conclusion, um, we do hope that the EU member states will make a reasonable use of the discretion allowed by the new EU rules, otherwise the goal of harmonization uh, will be a, a dream. We hope that the complexity resulting from these rules does not affect the quality of listed uh, company accounts. And we do insist on the need to find practical solution for multinational groups operating across borders who must be able to use the services of the same firm or the same couple of firms in case of joint audit. Thank you for your attention. Well, um, I had a preview on the, um, on the busmaster questions, um, and there's one. Uh, which I would like to ask, actually, and that is that do you think that the business perspective has been incorporated enough into the current reforms, or do you think it creates too many obstacles? And when we take a close look at the question of Aiden Lamp, maybe you can make that larger. Um, Monique? Um, it has actually sort of the same... I think I've, I've pretty much answered that. Yes, the answer is yes, I do believe that uh, the outcome of the EU reform um, is, is a disappointment uh, from our perspective. It is going to make for a fragmented landscape, too complex, 
uh, too many com constraints. Each, each individual constraint may be justifiable, uh, but it's the accumulation of all these constraints that makes it extremely complex to, uh, to manage, uh, not only, as I said, by the audit firms themselves, but also for the companies. And that, that is a serious concern. And I must say, I think that the insistence on competition, on increased competition, um, has uh, had one of the consequences has been there's not enough attention to the quality of audit, which I think mm. should have been the, uh, the uh, prominent uh, concern for, for the reform. Okay. Is there another question here which you'd like to address? A very small... Are regulators attempting to harmonize a section of options interpretation? Okay. Well, it, it so happens one? that I'm also a member of the board of the French Financial Markets Authority, and, um, and uh, I, I don't think so. I think at this, at this point, there are so many options for, for the member states to, con to concern that they, they are, every, every state is considering its own specificities uh, and deciding, before deciding what to do. Uh, now, hopefully, there will be consultations at an appropriate time. But at this point, as we can see from the previous speaker, uh, it's clear that regulators are not the ones who have the final word in this matter. Thank you so much. Well, we have a third question. Why don't we answer that as well? Um, business would, maybe, you, yeah. Business would like consistency. Are options protectionists? I, I, business would like consistency, that's clear. Um, I wouldn't say the options are protectionist. I, I think the options have been included um, in response to uh, concerns expressed by various uh, member states because of the way their own uh, audit uh, landscape has evolved over time. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to, to look a little bit at the differences amongst member countries, uh, organizations and structures. Uh, is there a public oversight body? Not everywhere. Uh, and in some cases, in fact, the public oversight body is very recent. In other cases, it's very old. I mean, uh, every member state has had uh, specific concerns and they have been addressed throughout the legislation. So we now have a situation where, um, for instance, France uh, has uh, fought throughout the, ne the negotiation to keep the joint audit, not to extend it everywhere, as I've heard very often. I mean, uh, we, France has never sought to impose joint audits everywhere, but it wanted that to be not only preserved, but also taken into consideration when deciding on the various constraints, because we believe joint audit is one possible answer to the independence of auditors. The problem we have now is that we have uh, a sum of constraints that is considerable, and that's, that's the issue. But I don't think it was for protectionist uh, uh, concerns. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this question. One personal question. How come your English is so brilliant? I don't hear a French accent in your English. My father was a diplomat, and I lived in the U.S. for 10 years. So. Ah! Ah! Well, that's... And I uh, worked in the two U.S. also. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and giving this great speech. Our fourth and final speaker is Alain Deckers, Head of Unit Audit and Credit Rating Agencies at the European Commission. Great to have you here. And um, we will enjoy your speech. Give him an applause. Thank you very much. Well, after listening to the last intervention, I sort of uh, was wondering, what have I got myself into? Uh, but uh, before going to the substance, let me say, uh, it's, I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, I, um, it's a pleasure to see a number of familiar faces in the audience. Uh, having been in the Commission for a while, you tend to be, bump into the same people uh, on, on repeated occasions. Uh, I was recently, uh, my last job, dealing with banking regulation, but uh, a few years before that I, dealt, uh, I was working in the uh, accounting and financial reporting unit, uh, and a number of people who are, are sitting in this uh, um, uh, room today uh, have, uh, I have uh, worked with with a great deal of pressure, pleasure in the past, and I look forward to doing uh, that again in, in this new position. 
Um, this conference is, is a great opportunity to uh, talk about these issues which are extremely topical. We're now one year away uh, from the implementation of the reform and indeed as we've seen from the previous uh, three presentations we are at a fairly critical juncture with many countries now either consulting or deciding about the implementation of uh, the reform so um, I think it is a, a tribute to, to fee to organize uh, this conference at this stage and perhaps it's just because you organize it at the same time of the year every year I, I don't know but uh, in, it, it comes at, at, at the right time um, let me start uh, by, uh, I presume the slides are somewhere over here, yeah, there we go, uh, by uh, uh, repeating again the sort of underlying objectives of the reform, but I think this is now familiar to everybody since it's been mentioned by uh, Commissioner Hill and by a number of uh, the uh, speakers uh, that have uh, spoken just now. Um, of course, we, as, as, as part of the audit reform, sought to uh, strengthen the quality and robustness of, of uh, uh, audits um, by, uh, in, amongst other things, uh, enhancing, for example, the independence of the auditor. That is uh, intended to provide uh, greater investor protection and therefore invest investor trust in uh, financial information and lead to stronger capital markets. And as Commissioner Hill has explained, uh, stronger capital markets at this stage are one of the key priorities of the Commission in the context of the Capital Markets Union, uh, which um, is currently uh, being developed. Uh, and as you know, the Commission intends to come up to publish an action plan on the Capital Markets Union uh, in the near future. What are the key pillars of uh, the reform? Uh, first of all, uh, enhancing uh, information to investors uh, through uh, great, more, more informative audit reports uh, and additional information also provided to audit committees, for example. Uh, strengthened independence regime, we've heard a great deal about that. Maybe some people consider uh, the requirements in the regulation uh, uh, excessive, but there they are. Uh, we have a mandatory rotation period. Uh, to encourage professional skepticism. And indeed, if we look at some of the recent uh, events uh, in, in, in with some uh, audits uh, scandals that are still emerging in the not so distant past and even quite recently um, in, 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 in Europe, I think there is a fair point uh, that uh, does need still a, a bit of work to, to be fully addressed. Uh, another example is a 70% cap or, or the cap uh, 70% is the, is the baseline, but the cap uh, on uh, um, non-audit services. We also try to foster market diversity and competition. This is also uh, some of the reasoning that lies behind the blacklist and, uh, for example, the prohibition of big four uh, only uh, clauses. Now, perhaps uh, the key issue, as we've heard at this stage, is uh, the uh, questions uh, surrounding the consistent uh, implementation of the reform. There are indeed a number of options in uh, the texts. Uh, that is a, uh, not an accidental outcome of the legislative process, but it was uh, certainly something that was wanted by uh, the legislators. Uh, so we have to live with it. Um, we are working intensively with member states uh, to uh, ensure as the greatest degree of consistency in the implementation of uh, the, the reform. We have held uh, so far uh, transposition workshops, for example, and we will continue to do so during the second half of this year, which will be really the critical period when all these choices on options, for example, will start to be uh, becoming, uh, try to start, start to emerge into the public domain. Uh, we keep an open dialogue with stakeholders. Indeed, this conference is, is an example of it, but we also do that in, uh, through other uh, means. Uh, and we hold regular meetings with um, national audit authorities, uh, including in the context of uh, the EJOB, uh, and in that context also the discussion about the establishment of the new uh, Committee on uh, European Audit Oversight, oversight Bodies. Um, 
I think it's fair to say that the, the, the profession has a crucial role to play in this area, which again is why we are keen to maintain dialogue with the industry. Um, what I hear are a lot of concerns about the choices that member states will be making, and I can only encourage you as a profession, but also from the uh, broader business sector, to engage with your national authorities, because of course we can work uh, with them uh, in Brussels to try to ensure this consistent implementation, but primarily the choices have to be made at national level, and therefore I think it is, it is also in your interest to have a, a lively and a constructive engagement with uh, your national authorities to ensure that when the choices are made at national level, that the product that we have to work with uh, when the discussions reach Brussels uh, allow that consistent implementation of the reform uh, across the EU. Priority areas for the future. Um, we uh, have a, a new provision, as you know, in uh, the text on um, market monitoring, which is something that we are keen to develop. Uh, we are currently starting this debate uh, with, uh, national, with public oversight authorities uh, to develop the basis on which to uh, um, uh, develop these uh, reports that will have to be produced for the first time by the middle of next year. Uh, you probably know there are national reports due. There is also a report by the European Competition uh, Network that is due. Uh, and uh, we will then, after consultation with uh, CAOB and the European Supervisory Authorities, uh, produce a report uh, of our own. Uh, one of the things we will be looking at very carefully is the question of market concentration, uh, including within specific sectors, and how that develops as a, cons uh, as, as a follow up to the reform, because indeed one of the objectives of this uh, reform is to promote greater competition in this sector. Second point, uh, enhancing EU-wide EU supervision. Um, this is an area that I think everybody is committed to, both in the business sector and uh, at national level in, in amongst national authorities. Uh, we have started preparatory work and discussions with national authorities uh, related to the creation of the new CEAOB, uh, which has a number of specific tasks under uh, the new uh, reform texts uh, and will replace the European, uh, the expert group of uh, audit oversight bodies with a number of stronger powers, uh, notably also in the international area uh, where uh, ESMA will also be brought into the picture and, 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 and play an important role. Uh, facilitating cross-border uh, application, again, I've talked about that before, that is really one of the uh, uh, key concerns I hear in, in the last month since I uh, started this job from a number of stakeholders, and that is definitely something that we want to address. In fact, I, I spoke before about the uh, transposition workshops that we're organizing with member states, and at the last transposition workshop, we launched a specific dialogue with uh, national authorities concerning uh, the uh, cross-border implications uh, of the different uh, options that are uh, set out in the, uh, in the regulation, uh, in particular, for example, looking at the, uh, at the blacklist. And finally, uh, another uh, uh, key priority for us, and I think this is a theme that also uh, our commissioner mentioned before, is avoiding unnecessary burdens for business, and in particular for smaller companies, um, the, there is no additional burden for uh, uh, companies uh, that do not qualify as a PIE, uh, but uh, we are also keen to maintain uh, clarity about the fact that uh, there, is no, uh, th there is no requirement for additional audit burdens for smaller undertakings that do not qualify as PIEs, and uh, that uh, where member states choose to impose audit requirements, there is a possibility for a simplified requirements. What can we do uh, as Commission and looking ahead? Again, we will continue to play our role as an honest broker in this discussion about transposition, transposition which is now really heating up and uh, needs to be completed in the, um, in the next uh, year. Um, we do that uh, through the usual tools that we have, uh, uh, both at bilateral level and uh, through our uh, groups uh, in, in Brussels. Um, 
We will, of course, uh, take stock and uh, monitor developments uh, as the reforms are being implemented. Uh, and uh, if necessary, we will draw conclusions about that uh, when we have uh, sufficient information. Uh, I should, however, say that um, I don't think the focus at this stage should be about talking about changing the rules. The focus, the rules are there, we've adopted them. Uh, the focus now should be to make them work in practice. And that is certainly the issue that we are focused, in, uh, focused on at, at this stage. Uh, you um, may also uh, uh, know that, uh, um, I think it's fair to say that this commission has uh, a lesser focus on uh, pro proposing new regulatory initiatives than the previous commission had for obvious reasons um, linked to the uh, situation, the, the crisis of the last few years. Um, but uh, you should not, I think, expect a, a very uh, quick uh, proposal to change the rules. Our focus really at this stage is on implementing the rules and making them work. And uh, finally, uh, one of the things that strikes me uh, as I have uh, struck me as I listen to the debate today, um, and I compare that to what some of our counterparts uh, abroad, uh, outside EU, are saying, is is that. Uh, our reform outside the EU is seen very much as a um, being at the leading edge of, of, of audit regulation. And uh, many countries, a number of countries that, are, that I've already spoken to in, in, in the last month, really see the EU as a model they might want to follow uh, in terms of uh, further developing audit regulation. Uh, and that's certainly something that we uh, intend uh, to uh, maintain. I uh, certainly agree with uh, Stephen Hadrill that there is no question that we should impose our model on anybody else, uh, but certainly where our model contains good features, we should uh, try to promote those at uh, international level. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, next 12 months really are a critical period um, to ensure that the objectives of the reform uh, are uh, achieved. Uh, we are working intensively with member states uh, to ensure that uh, the implementation reaches those objectives and um, we certainly are uh, attentive to some of the concerns that have been raised uh, in this uh, uh, conference and we will continue to engage with all parties concerned to address those concerns. Uh, my uh, door is always open. If any of you ever want to visit in Brussels uh, to talk about these things, I'd be very happy to do that. Thank you very much. Well, Alain, um, we set your Buzzmaster question on the screen. Mm -hmm. It's quite small, so maybe you could... Um, Read it, I will read it. Do you believe that more is needed to ensure an effective and consistent implementation of the new EU audit rules? More than what? Yeah. Um, looking at the answers, uh, was it what you, what you expected? I think given some of the concerns that we've heard today, it's not a surprise that that is, uh, that, that is the, the split of uh, opinion, the balance of opinion in the room. Mm. Uh, again, I can only emphasize that this is certainly an issue to which we are committed. Uh, we are using all the tools at our disposal, whether it is in dialogue with member states, whether it is in dialogue with the industry, whether it is by publishing uh, um, uh, question and answers on, on our yeah. website uh, yeah. to try to encourage that consistent implementation. If there are additional ideas, I'm okay. very uh, well. I'm very open to them. Okay. Um, and again, uh, one of the things I really want to emphasize is we can do so much in Brussels, but really, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done at national level also. And again, I would repeat uh, my invitation to you, as a profession or as business representatives, to engage with your authorities at national level during this very very critical period. Uh, uh, which uh, certainly we have seen illustrated very well in the three previous pre presentations, yeah. but I think are replicated across the broad Do you recognize their concerns? I think it's a perfectly legitimate concern. I think at this stage it's a little bit difficult still to say exactly how things are going to pan out because 
Uh, I mean, we've heard in the UK there has been no decision yet about which op how, how options are going to be implemented. Uh, in Germany, a consultation document has just been put out. And there, there is no draft law yet uh, adopted by the government. Uh, in France, consultations are ongoing. Okay. So we're a little bit talking uh, in still uh, in, in the fog without really knowing exactly what we're talking about. But okay. I think as we move uh, forward in the next uh, weeks and, and months, sh things should become clearer, and that then will allow us to have a much better understanding of what can be done and what should be done uh, at European level to try to address okay. these concerns. Another question. Is the Commission considering amendments to the legislation to fix some of the issues that have been mentioned? Well, as I said, I think we're, we're at this stage, we're focused on making sure that the rules as they are today okay. uh, are implemented. I don't think it would be useful or helpful at this stage to start talking about amendments to the legislation that would create uncertainty in the market. What we need to do now is, uh, is, is coalesce around the, the rules that have been adopted um, and make sure those work in practice. I'm not sure that if we proposed amendments, we would necessarily end up with a different result. Um, so uh, it's questionable whether that would be a, a solution in any case. Uh, but as I mentioned, amendments to the legislation are not really on the horizon in the short term, I think. Okay. Let's look at some of the questions which came out of the audience. Um, quite a lot. Um, well, let's have a look together what came in. See, a lot of people are... Asking questions anonymous. Hmm. Can we light up their uh, screens, uh, Monique? No, no, just joking. Um, Ella, what question uh, would you like to address? Do you see a, a nice one which you... Um, they're all very good questions. Difficult to choose. Um, <laughs> Well, I can maybe um, address the uh, top one of the second column. Um, the orange one? Great, the you're doing the, orange the one, trans yeah. I yeah. mean, uh, there's a very simple... Re there's a very simple Let me read uh, it out for people without glasses. Yeah. Great, you're doing the trans transposition workshops. Can you invite the profession to contribute? No change expected on the short term. B. <laughs> I don't know what the B is, but... <laughs> um, we, uh, these discussions we have mem with member states uh, are uh, of a nature that uh, we, we don't generally invite uh, external participants to those. Uh, that doesn't mean that we're not interested in talking to the profession. Uh, we are. Uh, you have an open invitation from me to uh, uh, meet if at any stage you want to do that. I think there are other fora in which we can, we can also do that. Um, so. From, from, from the point of view of efficiency, is also it's, 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 it's sometimes easier to, to, to handle different stakeholders and different uh, uh, fora. Uh, but that does not in any way uh, imply that we're not open to discussion with the profession. We certainly are open to that. So. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Alain. Can I invite the other speakers to uh, sit behind the desk? Because uh, we're going to the final panel discussion and uh, at the former panels. Uh, I was actually asking all the questions, but for this panel we opened the bus master and uh, when you want to ask a question you can raise your hand and uh, one of the microphonists uh, will uh, come to you. Uh, so we make it a bit more active. So at the end of the day the energy uh, goes up. So I'll send Noemi to the left uh, wing and who's going to take the right wing? Ah, one of the others. Okay, well Questions or comments for the panel, but I will start with one of my questions and um, What does the business community think about the process? How are things going so far? Who could pick up this question? Yeah Stefan uh, We um, we we are somewhat disappointed with the result of the uh, uh, reform, uh, but we still have to see how the member states go about uh, implementing it. And so we're very active uh, in discussing that with the member states. But also, as I mentioned, we, we've, uh, the business um, uh, community, the Business Europe has written to Lord Hill to raise the concern uh, I, I mentioned earlier about um, audit consistency for multinational groups. 
Okay, another question. Should we reform the reform? <laughs> yeah? Stefan? Well, probably, but I, mean, I think we've got to be careful about what we wish for. I mean, if that means going through uh, further council discussions, further parliamentary discussions, I'm not at all sure what we'll end up with at the end. So um, much as I would like to say yes to it, I, I don't think it's a, a practical proposition, and we just have to make sure that you know, we do as much as we can within the existing uh, arrangements. Okay, yeah. James Barber has a question for the panel. Do you believe the audit reforms will achieve the objectives that were established at the outset? Kai, could you address that question? Uh, I can do. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, as Alan mentioned it too, uh, on the one hand side, uh, uh, we have clear objectives uh, included in this audit reform, and it's uh, more on the national level that uh, now uh, the local governments, the national governments, uh, have to ensure that this uh, uh, um, objectives have been achieved. Uh, it's uh, not so far the, the, the task of the EU Commission uh, uh, to ensure in each uh, 28 member states that all the uh, uh, objectives can be achieved. Uh, so uh, I agree to what Alan said. It's, it's, it's a question to the, to the national government to make sure that these uh, objectives could be achieved. Okay. We have a live question from the audience. Um, yeah, thank you, Matthias Schuppen from Stuttgart, Germany. It's mainly a question to Alan, but perhaps Mr. Martens could say something to that as well. Um, you mentioned that the Commission wants um, more competition. Um, on the other hand, you may be aware that we have a real issue in the profession with um, audit fees, uh, which was discussed uh, during the two days um, extensively. Um, basically, we haven't intense competition in the um, profession and the question my question is are you aware of the fact that there may be a difference between competi competition and choice well i think of course uh, there is no choice if there is no competition um, uh, that is that is certainly uh, something that, uh, that, that Clear. Uh, the question of uh, competition, as I think Stephen Hadrell mentioned before, of course can have different consequences. Competition can drive quality, it can drive innovation, or it can drive a race to the bottom. And certainly we do not want competition to drive a race to the bottom. Um, and, 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 and there are some uh, elements in uh, the uh, reform that are intended to uh, prevent or, or, or reduce the risk, certainly, that that, that, that will be the case. Um, so uh, I, I can certainly uh, hear the concern that you have uh, that there may be unintended consequences. Uh, I think it is also for the profession to ensure that uh, those unintended consequences are avoided. That is not to say to engage in anti-competitive behavior but to understand that the interest of all stakeholders in this area is to move towards higher quality audits and, and, and to promote innovation in this area of, 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 of auditing, whether it's through new technology uh, or, 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 or new ways of, of, of thinking about audits. Um, so, um, again, I, I, I think I understand the risk that you're pointing to, but I think that that is not, certainly not an inevitable outcome of, of competition. Okay. We have a question from Mirela. It's uh, in the right corner, right bottom corner. Can you make that larger, Monique? And where's Mirela? Who would you like to answer this question? Shall I ask the question? Yeah. No, you, uh, w we will make it larger, but who would you like to answer you? Uh, I was thinking the question for Mr. Mrs. Uh, for Mr. Alan Decker, but it's possible for all okay. of the members too. For all of them. Okay, yeah. we start with Mr. Alan Decker, and then we ask a reaction from one of the other panel members, because otherwise maybe he gets overworked. <laughs> well, the uh, the scope of a statutory, statutory audit uh, has been the subject of, of some debate recently in, in, in recent legislative changes. 
whether it's in the context of uh, the accounting directives or in the context of the audit reform, and I don't see any uh, uh, prospect that will be reopened in any fundamental way in the near future. Um, I don't know whether that uh, question also uh, uh, refers to the possibility of extending the scope of the, the definition of PIEs covered by the regulation at national level. Uh, that is a choice for member states to make, and uh, I don't think we uh, would be in, in, in a position to uh, say what choice member states should make in that respect. Okay. One of the other panel members who likes to contribute to this question, yeah? Stefan? It's working, yeah? So yeah, say it a bit closer. The, the provision of negative assurance and all some things in the corporate report. And I, I think that, that, that implies that, uh, that, <laughs> that <laughs> it's scary, that, that, um, First, I had problems with my glasses. Now I've got problems with this thing. They, that, implies, that implies that you know there's actually very little work done to provide that negative insurance. In fact, quite a lot of work is done to provide that negative insurance. The auditor really does need to have an understanding of the business in order to do that. So that 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 I think um, should be made clearer. And secondly, yes, I think there are some things about the statutory audit that, as the nature of business changes, the way in which businesses are organised. You know, should work, should possibly brought in, be brought into scope. Now, I don't I don't have a list there, but I do think it, it's something that we should keep under under close review. Okay, let's have a look at uh, one of the other questions coming in. I see a question from Peter Krish. Um, yeah, there it is. Do you generally believe the reform leads to audit market deconcentration? Peter, who would you like to answer? This question. <laughs> Whoever has a view. Okay. Whoever has a view. Well, that's a challenging. Uh, that's a challenging one. Yeah. I see some movement on the left side of the panel. Yeah, yeah. I, Kai, I can we start I with you? Start, I will I will start. Uh, I think what we can see uh, in the German audit market is that uh, we have on the one hand side uh, the big four audit firms, like we have it in all other. Uh, mem member states, but what we can see is that uh, the so-called uh, second-tier uh, audit firms uh, become more and more uh, uh, bigger. There have been a lot of uh, mergers over the la within the last uh, one or two years, and uh, it could be that uh, uh, that uh, on the one hand side this increased concentration. That's right. If you if you if you measure the, the concentration rate, that's clear. On the other hand side, if you have more and more uh, bigger audit firms in the second uh, uh, tier, then this is also a contribution to, to the competition. So this is, uh, has two sides, yeah? that's two sides. So it's not a clear answer to your question, I know, yeah? but I think we have to see both. Yeah? We have to see that this is, a, I think maybe it's in UK the same, I don't know, that uh, you have this mergers within uh, the audit firms in the, in, in the second tier, I don't know, or in France, but we have it clear. So, for example, Massa with uh, RBS is, was one of the large, uh, uh, the, the last uh, mergers which we had. So this is this. Uh, so it's going more and more offers for 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 the companies, uh, uh, and um, uh, this will increase uh, uh, competition. I think this is one of the direction of the reform. Additionally, oh, we have seen uh, some mergers in the second uh, tier, as you say. Um, also, I think we've we've uh, seen a, there's been a positive movement in the sense that we had an increasing level of concentration even within the big four in certain sectors, financial services in in particular, uh, energy to some extent. So th that seems to have been reversed a bit by retendering, and that's got to be a good thing. Um, the the other thing which I think would, it's a bit too early to assess yet is what's happening in the non audit services market. Uh, we're so, I mean, as audit services move, so non-audit services move in parallel as a reaction to that. And the question is, will some of the mid-tier firms pick up some of that work and become stronger as a consequence and eventually be able to bid for the, for the audit work in future? Now, we don't, I don't know, I haven't got a crystal ball that tells me where that's going to settle, but it is a possibility and I think quite an encouraging one. Okay, thank you. Well, um, 
We nearly have to finish the panel, and I would like to give Henry Irving the honor of having the last question. He was one of the most fanatic Busmaster users these days. He even used it last night. At three o'clock this night, I got questions coming in from him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, honor him with the last question. And it is, will these reforms stop the next financial crisis? Um, yeah, who likes to pick up this question? Mr. Schrik. Well, <clears throat> I think financial crisis are the sign uh, of, a, of a complex economy and uh, that no reform can prevent a financial crisis. Uh, but what reforms can do is that they can reduce the consequences of financial crisis uh, if they're properly implemented. And I think that the reforms that have been passed over the past few years um, do have that possible effect, uh, but uh, it's too early to say what form the next financial crisis will take. The only thing we can say is that hopefully we won't repeat the mistakes of the past. Okay. Well, Stefan, would you do the last answer to this question? Well, I, um, I think Henry, from a couple of questions I've seen, the ones I've been able to read anyway, um, is seeing these... I've overcome my vanity now, so I'm much more effective. The, 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 is seeing these reforms through the lens of the financial crisis, and I, I can understand that, because actually when the proposals came out from Commissioner Barnier, that was a big driver of them. But I think as the work has gone on, We've seen that there were many other things that need to be addressed in audit. The over-concentration that we've just talked about in some respects, but also the lack of innovation, the commoditization of the, of the, of the process, and the, the diminishing um, confidence amongst investors, or indeed interest amongst investors. And all those things, I think, are addressed by the, by the reforms. And, uh, they're not going to stop the next financial crisis, but they may still do some good in those areas. Okay. Panel, thank you so much. Give them a big applause. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being open. Thank you for delivering great speeches.